Well, before Jingjing starts, uh, I just wanted to thank Rachel again. Rachel, uh, you know, you could easily be a surgeon. You have such precision in bringing people back into the main room. So thank you. <laughs> Jingjing, yeah. over to you. Uh, yeah, so, um, so it's my great honor to introduce you, Professor Ramya Krishnan. Uh, professor Krishnan is a William and Ruth Cooper Professor of Management Science and Information Systems and Carnegie Mellon. So for more than a decade, he has also served as the Dean of the Heinz College of Information Systems and the Public Policy at CMU. He's actually the founder of the Information Systems and Management Program at CMU. Um, Krishna has many leadership roles within the research community, as all of us know. He's a recent president of Informs. He also served as a former president of both the Informs Computing Society and Information Systems Society. He has also taken many editorial roles, including the department editor in management science, editor for, I, editor for ISR, and editor for informed GOC, etc. Um, in addition to the service to research community, Krishna is also actively involved in many public administration services. He's on the advisory board for the state of Pennsylvania. He also serves as an IT and a data science expert member of multiple US state government uh, delegations. And uh, to recognize his years of public service and expertise, he's named as a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. In terms of research interest, Krishnan's research focuses on consumer and social behavior in digitally instrumented environments. Um, his work has addressed technical policy business problems that arise in those contexts. He has published extensively on these topics so I did a quick uh, Google Scholar search and I found that he has 473 articles under his name. And these keywords of the articles were network analysis, e-commerce, privacy, pricing. And um, because he's very productive research rec uh, uh, a record, he has received many research awards. Um, I think I probably need another 10 minutes or so to list all the rewards that Krishna has received for his research contribution. But I think you guys are probably wanting to hear Krishna talk, not me talking. So in summary, uh, I think Krishna is the best example of someone who truly excels in so many different dimensions, a productive researcher, a wonderful leader, and a great mentor that many of us look up to. So thank you very much for being with us today, Krishna. And folks, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Professor Krishna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, share my screen. Um, let me go there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can see you. So, thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, I appreciate the, the introduction and I want to thank uh, Vijay uh, for inviting me to join you uh, this morning. Um, thank you Vijay for this opportunity. And also thanks to Rachel for this amazing job and uh, how she's managing this. Um, Vijay gave me 30 minutes to provide a, an overview of some ideas and topics uh, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, and then we have 15 minutes for uh, Q&A. Is that correct, Vijay? Okay, great. So um, what I wanted to talk about um, is what I'm calling social cyber physical systems. Uh, and uh, the capacity to really innovate as a community at this intersection of uh, decision science, data science, and social science. So what exactly uh, am I talking about? Uh, I caught the very end uh, of um, uh, Professor Mark's uh, talk, um, and um, I, I could imagine that, you know, to this audience, the first point that I'm making which is, it's been true now for a while, which is the very ubiquity of um, our capacity to sense uh, and collect data about behaviors of various sorts uh, of the system of the individual uh, has, has grown tremendously. It used to be the case that this was uh, something that you could do um, at, with great um, uh, detail and granularity online. But increasingly with the availability of various devices, and the, the classic example, of course, is you know, uh, GPS and uh, uh, traces on phones, but you could imagine Fitbits, you could imagine all sorts of other uh, 
mechanisms for capturing uh, very granular data about offline behaviors as much as online behaviors, that there's both a cyber aspect as well as a physical aspect. So that's a cyber physical element. And the fact that people live in these cyber physical environments means that there's an opportunity for us to think about the design of these systems, the understanding of individual behaviors within these systems. And that's really, I think, a, a real opportunity for us as a community. Um, the second is that, uh, as, as you're all well aware, um, there's increasing use of um, algorithms and models uh, and their deployments uh, in a variety of data-driven uh, decision settings. And that's resulted in um, a set of concerns on the one hand, uh, valid uh, concerns, as well as the need to design in issues of how systems can be used in an ethical, inclusive, fair kind of way. So these are two big themes. Um, I will not speak about the, the second one, though I've done work in that area, uh, but certainly we'll, we'll speak to the first. There's a, a center that I lead at CMU called the Block Center for Technology and Society that um, for those of you interested, you could go take a look at some of the things that we're doing there. Now, the second uh, point that I wanted to make, and I'll use two, two illustrations of this, is that I think there's a, a real opportunity for us um, to think about how to bring together data science, decision science, and social science. And, I, and I've labeled this data intensive decision science um, and data intensive social science. And I'll try to offer um, examples of each of these. In both cases, and this is perhaps a, um, some, something that has characterized much of the work that I've done, uh, has been um, that it's been situated in and driven by real world problems, be it business problems or societal problems, which then generate a set of phenomena that require um, bringing together uh, different approaches uh, uh, that draw on these different types of methods um, to solve problems where there's an opportunity both to solve a problem and have impact, but equally well make methodological contributions along the way. So let me, um, and, and um, this clearly play, plays out in a number of different settings, not limited uh, certainly to people-centric sensing, uh, which our community is often focused on, but certainly in, in other, other domains. And if there is time uh, in the discussion session, I could say a few words about the task force that I'm leading um, uh, about reopening the economy of Pennsylvania uh, in, in support of the governor's uh, office. So uh, let me give you an example. Uh, I'm going to use two papers. I, um, I told Vijay that rather than think about you know, the past, the present, the future, that I would talk about two relatively recent papers. This paper uh, just got accepted in ISR just a week ago. Uh, it's the work of my student, Ying Jie Zhang, who's uh, at UT Dallas, at um, Bebe Li, and I co-advised her. Um, and this is a good example of uh, uh, some of the points that I wanted to make. So everybody, uh, at least a few months ago, uh, used taxis and um, you know, uh, ride-hailing um, uh, kinds of systems. Um, one of the things that we were working with a large um, uh, taxi company uh, that effectively uh, had the entire market in a large Asian city. And one of the things that they had was very granular data about um, the occupancy of the vehicle, not only the GPS traces, as you might expect, but the, whether, the, whether the cab was occupied or not. Um, and the daily income that the driver made, and also decision-making by the driver, as in when the, when the cab was empty, what did they do? Did they just wait around as to where they dropped the customer off? Did they um, sort of uh, drive around the city to try and figure out um, where to pick up the next customer? So the idea was that are there ways of helping less informed drivers because they found that there was a, quite a bit of heterogeneity in terms of income uh, between drivers. Uh, the newer drivers versus the older drivers, the more experienced drivers. So the problem that we were really solving for was to ask the question, can we really understand decision-making behavior of individual drivers? 
but then use that as a mechanism to set policy for the firm so that it could sort of um, provide information to everybody in ways that might potentially um, uh, improve the incomes of all, not necessarily move incomes from the drivers that do well to the drivers that don't do well, but can we increase the size of the pie? This is the original conversation that we had that then led to uh, a really interesting uh, set of discussions and, and work that is in the ISR paper that you're, you're, uh, I'd recommend you read for more of the technical details. So everybody's familiar with GPS traces uh, and the nice thing about this, uh, the firm, was that it had a, we had a complete data about the market. It's about 11,200 uh, taxis, 25 million um, GPS traces for a, a, a month-long period that was made available to us with this charge um, <clears throat> to try and understand uh, behavior. So one of the questions that came up was, you know, how do how do these taxi drivers behave? And one of the things that uh, you have very detailed data here uh, with, with this firm is not only about the traces, which is the physical trajectory and movement of the vehicles, but you also have data about where pickups took place, where they are waiting around. And perhaps the firm has information also about who are, in a sense, what's a signal on competition? How many other vacant taxis were around uh, where this person um, was uh, deciding to stop or not stop. So you have this capacity to learn that the individual driver uh, was using both in terms of his or her own pickups and drop-offs, but they're also observing perhaps other drivers and their pickups and drop-offs and where people are waiting around. And this learning then could result in decision-making as to when they were empty, where should they go wait to reduce the time or minimize the wait time uh, for them uh, before they found another uh, customer. Um, so this was sort of the, the nature of the, uh, the exercise. Um, and we, uh, there were two interesting aspects. One was to sort of think about, um, and the firm thinking about this in a statistical machine learning way, which is purely looking at the data and asking the question, um, can we predict and help the driver decide where to go, where to go next? In other words, imagine a, a predictive tool that would uh, tell the driver based on where you're at and based on a variety of other features, uh, you know, here are the set of places that you should go to next. That was certainly one approach that we looked at. Another approach that we pursued was really to build a a model um, to try and uh, understand what might be the different factors that the, the driver was taking into account. And I think the most interesting part of the story is not so much the model, but by virtue of having this very detailed granular data, we were now getting to observe the kinds of in, uh, data that you typically don't ever get to observe in a traditional data set. So in other words, um, you not only got to observe where pickup and uh, drop-offs took place, but you also got information about um, which uh, taxis passed which other taxis, whether they were occupied or not, um, and whether those signals became relevant to driver decision-making behavior. So this unobserved kind of factors and unobserved knowledge became really important. Um, and that led us to, um, the details are in the, in the paper, but the point is that we um, developed a set of signals. So we mined the GPS trace data and the data from the firm to extract a set of signals, which were then embedded in a utility theoretic framework. And then we estimated um, a, a structural model um, to understand what are the sorts of uh, weights that um, the drivers were placing taking individual heterogeneity into account, we're placing on these different signals. Um, and the objective here was that then one could use this model in a counterfactual kind of way, which is the firm, and this is one of the key um, reasons why the firm preferred this approach, um, was that in, in contrast to the purely predictive statistical ML approach, uh, the idea here was they could control 
which signals they could make available to which drivers. So think about the, the intuition is this. Each individual driver gets to observe her or his state, which is based on what pickups they saw, what drop-offs they saw, and which uh, vacant taxis they passed. But the firm gets to see the entire uh, system. And by virtue of that, it could decide um, that it could send driver signals, it could broadcast information based on these mined GPS traces to drivers, which they could not personally observe because of the fact that maybe two blocks away there is, there is demand or there is less supply that they could then provide these as coordinating mechanisms to provide to drivers, but also improve service level to customers. So, um, this was the essence of the idea of uh, estimating a model where they could, in a counterfactual way, ask questions about if we change these different signals that we made available to drivers, what happens? Uh, so the work then result was consisted of two parts. One was actually uh, understanding individual driver behavior. The other was actually permitting this kind of counterfactual analysis um, that permitted the firm to ad actually address its uh, um, its interest, which was, you know, what should they broadcast? What kind of information should they broadcast? To whom should they broadcast? And this is a, a sort of a, like an optimization problem layered on top of um, the the model that was um, um, that had been built that would permit them to decide, you know, who should they send what information to, and then evaluate if that indeed resulted in um, improved outcomes, in this case, the outcomes of interest were things like daily income uh, for drivers, um, and they wanted to see which signal had the most impact. Okay, so um, that's sort of um, example one, and I, I see that I've gone longer than I wanted to on this, but uh, this is example one, okay, of the, the, f the first uh, paper that I wanted to share with you. Um, the second paper is, um, is work um, that we did with a large cell phone company. This is an ISR paper that came out like a year and a half ago. Uh, this is work with Bin Zhang, my student who's at Arizona, uh, and Paul Pavlou, who's now Dean at uh, Houston. Uh, this is work that we did when he was in Philly. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the problem that we were looking at here in this context was again, something that was a problem that was of interest to um, a large cellular telephone provider um, who um, had this challenge of figuring out um, what might be a way to virally propagate um, a, a kind of digital content called a caller ringback tone, which many of you probably are aware of, but I'll explain what that is in just a moment. But the um, the key challenge that they had was figuring out what is the role of uh, two different kinds of influence um, that might be relevant in the diffusion of this kind of viral content. Um, one is called direct influence. This is, some, this is often referred to as cohesion and many of you who have studied technology diffusion or the social network literature might be aware of these terms. Uh, and the other is called indirect influence, which is called structural equivalence. And I'll show you what that is in just a minute. But the point was that the firm wanted an understanding of how these factors, direct, direct influence or indirect influence, how, did, how relevant was it as a function of network size? And how should that then um, determine the nature of their targeting strategy? for um, getting this content virally propagated. This was the beginning of this uh, conversation that then led to you know, the, the work. The, 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 the paper is interesting, at least I think so, uh, but, and it has a, a, a number of interesting methodological contributions that we had to make. Um, but let me, in the interest of time, just jump to um, highlighting a few of these main points. Uh, the first is, if you see the figure that um, on the left, that is a, a direct influence, which is when an individual's adoption uh, of, in this case, a caller ringback tone is directly influenced through uh, the neighbors that I'm directly connected to. Uh, 
By the way, a caller ring back tone is when I might call Vijay, for instance, and let's say Vijay has already adopted a caller ring back tone. Uh, instead of the ring ring, I would actually hear the song or whatever the tune is that he's adopted. So every call to Vijay then is an exposure of that caller ring back that I'm getting exposed to that. And um, that would be an example of a direct effect, a, a direct peer type of influence. Um, the second kind of influence is what you see on the right is um, what's called an indirect peer influence or structural equivalence. And here the idea is that um, you are not directly connected, but you are, so if you look at um, nodes D and E, um, they are not directly connected, but the influence that D exerts on E is through the common alter A that they're connected to, right? So this is, this is sort of a, a two-hop type of neighbor. So D is a two-hop neighbor of E versus in the, in the first figure on the left, A and D are, are one-hop neighbors, okay? So, so these, there are these two effects. There's also homophily, uh, which is a you know, birds of a feather type of effect. You and I have correlated tastes and would that drive uh, adoption. So the idea in a, in a prior work, actually in management science, I had done work with uh, my student, Lie Ma, who's at, uh, at Maryland, uh, where we had looked at um, homophily uh, in, in purchase behavior. This, one, this paper focused on the simultaneous consideration of peer effects, uh, indirect uh, um, uh, peer influence and uh, homophily. And to do that, um, we had to um, bring together a collection of, uh, of methods. So this is a story also in terms of the need sometimes for developing new methods. Um, this is just to make sure I, I have clarified to you how exactly uh, the direct peer influence works. So if A calls uh, B and B is already an adopter, then A gets exposed. I explained that in the context of the example of Vijay. And uh, in, the, in the case of indirect peer influence, you're having this indirect influence um, via the altar, and oftentimes in the organization's literature, the argument has been made that B and C in, in, the, in the picture below uh, on the right um, are competing for the altar's attention, uh, and that becomes a basis for what might drive this kind of um, um, indirect influence. Okay, I recognize I'm going relatively fast through all of this. So um, in, the co in the discussion session, maybe we, a section we can uh, take this uh, more slowly. Uh, here again, we have a, a fairly large uh, data set, but the story is not about the data itself being large, but actually that there, are, there is structure to this large data set. So, so it's not just about having large amounts of data, but actually recognizing the structure that lies within. So this was about um, 1.4 million subscribers, and uh, we had a, you know more than 200 million calls actually uh, between these individuals that we had access to. Um, but the the main point was that um, there were interesting hypotheses that that were of interest to the firm about what are the forces driving adoption behavior, and how might that then become relevant. Uh, to the design of this, uh, uh, this targeting uh, uh, policy that I just spoke about. Okay, so from, again, this pa the paper has all the details, uh, but one of the key methodological challenges that we had to contend with uh, is if you're looking at adoption behavior, so think of this as a large graph where every node uh, is labeled uh, you have a, a zero or a, or a one based on adoption. Uh, and you have this network structure in terms of who's connected to whom. Um, and the current statistical models for peer influence when we began work on this um, were quite limited. Um, and they did not accommodate a variety of requirements that we had to contend with, uh, which, are listed, uh, which are listed up here. So one of the things that we did, and I won't go through this model in detail, but one of the uh, very interesting contributions uh, that Ben uh, made as part of his uh, thesis uh, was um, to develop actually a, a multiple network autoprobit model 
uh, which then got extended in the course of in the course of this work. Um, but the, the main uh, thing that's of perhaps of interest here is if you look at the second equation where you see z sub t equals x sub uh, t times beta, those are covariates related to things related to uh, the features of a node, the, the characteristics of a node, like centrality, et cetera. The theta sub t was uh, uh, the autocorrelation term, which was really important uh, to, uh, to try and, and model, uh, and then have both time independent effects as well as time dependent effects. And the theta sub t uh, was where I think we innovated in terms of taking into account both the W matrices, by the way, are the W1t and W2t are the matrices that actually account for the one hop network structure that a node has, as well as the two hop network structure that the node has. This is sort of, if you think of the uh, connection structures of interest here that, uh, that we are interested in, we developed a, a model um, that uh, could estimate these effects uh, simultaneously, the H that you see is homophily. So in other words, we developed a model specification, a statistical model that could simultaneously estimate the effects of interest, in this case, peer influence, indirect influence, and homophily. Um, and um, so that was one challenge that we had to contend with. The second challenge was that we had a very large data set but it, it, it turned out, and this was driven by intuition initially from the, the managers at the firm, that while we had large data sets, that there were subpopulations where um, there was structure, in other words, there was structure to this large data set. And it did turn out that there were uh, two structures, one um, of size, there were subgraphs of size 200 individuals, and subgraphs of size 500 individuals. And it was remarkable um, uh, that that structure existed within the larger, uh, larger network. And those um, subpopulations, we had to extract them. Uh, and they were extracted, by the way, by the way, they, they weren't pre-specified to be size 200 and 500. We identified them to be of size 200 and 500 by um, using uh, another uh, a technique uh, that we developed called transitive clustering and pruning. Um, this was uh, also work that Ben did uh, as part of his thesis um, that uh, uses a, 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 a ratio called the IE ratio, which is basically a clustering type of technique to identify subpopulations. So the first piece then is the statistical model. The second piece is identifying these subpopulations. And when we identified these subpopulations, we, we found that there was regularity in that structure. And therefore, then you could estimate these models, uh, the statistical model on these subpopulations of size 200 and, and 500. And what's interesting was that we found that in both the smaller groups as well as the larger groups, as you might expect intuition to suggest, that direct influence was positive and had a positive effect in both, it's positive and significant in both these settings, whether the size was 200 or whether the size was 500. However, when the group size was smaller, indirect influence, that is structural equivalence, had a negative effect. But, but what I mean by that is, if Vijay and I were in a two hop, uh, neighbor um, kind of network, if Vijay adopted the, I have a lower likelihood of adopting. Um, uh, in, in contrast, if Vijay and I were uh, one hop neighbors, if Vijay adopted and he exerted peer influence on me, then there would be a positive uh, likelihood that I would adopt as well. So one of the, and on the other hand, when, when the size of the network was larger, while direct influence still was positive and significant, we found that uh, the structural equivalence, the indirect uh, effect um, was in the other direction. So in other words, when group size was smaller, uh, there is a negative effect. And when group size is larger, uh, it had a positive effect. And this is sort of a very interesting question for 
from a managerial standpoint, um, and um, let me just get to the, 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 you know, in terms of um, the main point I wanted to make was that uh, when you're in a smaller group, the reason why there is a negative effect is in both cases, you're trying to distinguish yourself from, so if I and Vijay were competing for the attention of Jing Jing, then we want to distinguish ourselves. And if Vijay has adopted, I distinguish myself by not adopting. In, in contrast, if you're in a larger group and we were still competing for Jing Jing's attention, the, the differentiation takes place not by not adopting, but by the genre of adoption that takes place. In other words, we both adopt, but what we found was the genre of music that I adopted was dis different from the genre that, that Vijay had adopted. So this distinction between the nature of the effect as a function of network size um, and how to do that um, and to identify that in a robust, rigorous fashion, there's, there's locks in the paper about um, how we went through identification, et cetera. But I think this was the nugget that then led the firm to use a very different strategy for targeting in smaller groups versus larger groups. Um, so uh, this idea of identifying two hop customers and in larger groups and offering them um, different genres was motivated by this uh, approach versus thinking that there was a one size fits all effect independent of network size. So I think that, that was sort of the, the, the big punchline here was that while we uh, had to work with a large data set, extract subpopulations and estimate uh, different kinds of models, what it came down to, which is sort of an interesting insight was the nature of the effect as a function of network size, okay? So, um, so those are two um, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, ideas that I wanted to share with you. Um, and I wanted to return back to the key themes that I began with, which was that in both these cases, the, the, the paper uh, with the understanding individual uh, taxi behavior, taxi driver behavior, and how a firm might then use that to set policy, as well as this paper on direct and indirect peer influence effects, the driver and motivation in both cases was, in both cases, we are trying to understand individual behavior, but then uh, trying to see how that behavior then informs policy at the level of the firm uh, to decide in the taxi um, uh, firm case, deciding what to bro which signals to broadcast and to whom. And in the case of the cell phone company, the problem that they were interested in was actually a targeting strategy to try and increase uh, the adoption of the caller ring back tones. So in both cases, it was a problem that uh, motivated the, the work. Um, and in both cases, it required uh, us to sort of think about uh, what types of methods would we need to address those problems. In one case, the second paper, we actually had to innovate on developing new methods. In the first paper, uh, the methods that we had were quite adequate to address the problem. So let me pause here. I think I'm at 30 minutes. Uh, I should pause here and turn this back over to you, Jing Jing, um, um, so that we could have a discussion. I'm happy to also talk about the, the Pennsylvania reopening um, if there is interest. Thank you again. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you. So folks, if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to unmute yourself. Well, uh, Krishnan, uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the project with the Pennsylvania governor's office. That would be really awesome. Sure. Um, so let me see if I can um, show you that. Um, Um, 
So can you see this um, um, deck? You can see this now? Okay. Yeah. So, um, and as I'm sure in every one of the states that you're in, and some of you are from, uh, have called in from abroad, um, so in, in Pennsylvania, the, the governor issued his executive order uh, on the 18th of March and then tweaked it on April the 1st. There were a list of industries that were closed. Um, and um, one of the things that they approached us about, and I should say this work is I'm leading the CMU team. So there's a number of colleagues who, have, who have, are working with me on, uh, and contributing to this uh, effort. Um, and, our, uh, and we're working with the governor and his cabinet on the kinds of questions that they have. And I should say we are one little cog in a very uh, big wheel uh, in terms of, you know, I, I can't claim that this is what uh, permits them to make the decisions that they do. I'm sure that there are a lot of factors and we provide but one input. With all that as context and caveat, um, the, the idea was um, in, a, in a state like Pennsylvania, which is you know, the sixth largest um, uh, economy within the United States, uh, the question was how can they actually come up with a data-driven approach uh, to decide which industries and which counties can be reopened and what order how can we balance and take into account um, uh, you know, public health uh, and economic considerations? This is the, the initial discussion. Um, and our approach has been that you need to think about health, you need to think about public, the economics, but also in terms of workflow reengineering, um, in terms of how one thinks about rearranging and uh, reorganizing uh, work. Uh, and to do this, there's a need for both uh, data from state agencies um, and in particular, the idea was to do this. And let me just show you. Yeah, so the idea is to provide them, you see here, you'd see a health monitoring dashboard, economic monitoring dashboard, uh, and then um, you know this kind of what if analysis that's of interest. Um, so the, the key idea was that they wanted situational awareness of what's actually going on on the ground um, with respect to public health, uh, as well as with respect to economics. Uh, and in particular, the concern on the public health side, which you've probably heard in the press a lot, was um, what is the capacity of our hospital systems, either at the county level or more broadly in something called a health referral region uh, which, uh, so for instance, Pittsburgh serves a number of counties in, in Western PA, um, as well as in Ohio and West Virginia, for instance. Um, and the idea is to ensure that, is there adequate hospital capacity, uh, by which they mean medical beds, surgical beds, ICU beds, ventilation, uh, to accommodate uh, the demand uh, for, that, for that capacity, particularly when, if they choose to send back people to work, you're increasing the number of people that go back into society and to the economy, that will likely increase transmission risk, uh, which then means there'll be in increased demand for uh, hospital resources. So there was one set of questions related to understanding uh, hospital capacity and what the utilization currently is of that capacity and can we predict what the likely uh, ability of the hospital system is to accommodate the demand. This is sort of an OR-ish kind of problem that, um, that we had to contend with. The other was um, really situational awareness of in which county, from which industry, who's unemployed, um, what kind of um, um, unemployment compensation are they getting, um, and what kinds of social services are they consuming? Medicaid, uh, food stamps is SNAP, TANF is assistance to needy families. One of the challenges is that oftentimes the state administrative data resources were designed not for providing a real-time lens into what's going on. It takes something like five to six weeks before data if you file for an unemployment claim, before it ends up in a data mart, it takes about five to six weeks. So one of the questions was, can we really short circuit the time it takes to provide them 
with the real time lens into what's actually going on. The, the second issue, uh, and this is where you need both private sector data as well as public sector data to provide um, you know, more holistic view. Banks have um, data not only about, you know, many of us have our um, uh, checks deposited directly into our bank accounts. Our uh, employers send our checks directly into bank accounts. Banks have a very real time signal if you became unemployed, those direct deposits checks stop coming into your account. So banks have the capacity to aggregate from their private data, data up to an industry level and then county level uh, as to what's actually going on and be able to combine these sources then provides uh, policymakers with an understanding of, are we seeing, um, for instance, um, educational institutions are supposed to be closed per the executive order, but at Carnegie Mellon, we continue to work at a, at a distance. We are doing remote work. In other cases, restaurants are supposed to be open to do um, uh, curbside or for uh, pickup only, but we know that they're operate, operating at maybe 20% of their capacity. So trying to understand who's unemployed in which sector, in which geography has been an important aspect. Then last, last I think is, and this is work to be done, not done yet, which is when they pose questions about if I can open up a given industry in a given county, what if I did that? What is the implication of that? One for public health, but two for the economy, building models from these data to try and predict what the likely impact is likely going to be. It's the first order near term um, uh, kind of policy a question of interest that we are working towards. And uh, as I'll show you, much of their interest right now has been in scorecards that give them a variety of risk factors that they can work with, where the risk factors have been derived from different data sets. They could then apply that either to a county or to a region, and it becomes one of the inputs. So you'll see uh, the COVID cases risk in Pennsylvania, it's supposed to be you, you're required to have 0.05% of your, unless you have 50 per uh, 100,000 cases, uh, and that persists for 14 days, uh, that becomes a thresholding kind of factor with respect to reopening. Um, ICU capacity is a hospital utilization point I made. Population density has to do with, uh, is a, a proxy for transmission risk. Population age is a, a proxy for uh, the outcomes are worse because comorbidities for individuals who are older tend to be uh, correlated with age. And the reopening contact risk has to do with the percentage of at-risk individuals who are currently in closed industries that when opened, you're putting back into, the, into society and therefore potentially increasing the impact uh, on uh, both public health and, um, uh, and the question is, is there adequate capacity to address that? So this type of scorecard, and th by the way, they, every week as part of the governor's press conference, they release a version of this kind of scorecard. It's an interesting insight as to what is easy to communicate, what is easy for them to incorporate uh, versus the, we have more um, uh, sophisticated models, uh, but those are, uh, those are used for a different purpose than the kind of purpose that I'm showing the scorecard for. Uh, which is to communicate with the citizenry as to uh, what the state is of, you know, the various regions and counties. I can go on, but let me pause here. I hope I've given you a little feel for some of the things we're taking into account. Yeah, thank you, Krishnan. This is very, very impressive and also very informative. I never thought like a bank can provide the data that tells the uh, unemployment. <laughs> so I think that that now I think about it, that I think that is definitely very helpful. Um, so, um, so I think uh, now it's probably time that we will um, break the participant into breakout rooms. So I think, uh, Rachel, do you have the pre-assigned rooms? 